So now I would like to welcome on stage three members of um, the panel on happy people, ha happy organizations who are physically here. And they are Professor Sandro Formica, who teaches science of happiness and is a very inspired facilitator. Sandro, welcome. Pick a chair. Then we have Davide Bollati, who is chairman of Daviness. Welcome. And Oscar de Montigny, who is chief innovability and value strategy officer. And he is also president of Flow. Welcome. And remotely, we have two other guests who are Marco Alvera, who is CEO of SNAM and Karen Guggenheim, who's co-founder of Wohazu Foundation and the World Happiness Summit. Welcome to our guests. Good morning. Very nice to see you. We have them here. And last but not least, our, uh, our third guest from Bhutan. And it is wonderful, Dasho Karmaura, who is president of the Center for Bhutan studies and the GNH, which as we're hearing is really the most effective strategy <coughs> to incorporate happiness into the policies of a nation. So it's wonderful to have you here. We are going to be brief but intense. And I would like to, I'm sitting back a bit so I can see you all. I would like to start with Professor Formica. Yes, happiness is a science. And you changed your professional life as a result of a personal turnaround. So can you share with us, um, in the few minutes you have, but you're a pro at that, the tools that are really necessary to have in order to be true to oneself and not rely on other people's approval in order to feel happy? Beautiful. Um, uh, you can take your mask off because... Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only one with mask. <laughs> Well, still, it so, is a thing to do. Um, yeah, what happened to me is, uh, is what I know this happens to many, many uh, of us. Uh, we live a life uh, without being fully self-aware. And uh, when I realized, and it would take too long to uh, explain why, but when I realized that I was not living my life at all, because what I was doing is uh, trying to... Uh, be approved by my mother the same way uh, she did with my father. Um, I really uh, started with a tabula rasa, it means I had, everything had to be reconstructed in a way. And I didn't know who I was, what I was doing, but I had a doctoral uh, degree in, in business uh, with a specialization in hospitality and tourism. And sure enough, my father was first a, a teacher and then ended up uh, uh, leading the uh, tourism uh, sector, public sector in, uh, in central Italy. So I said, oh my God, who am I? What am I supposed to be doing here? And, uh, and then I started... Uh, looking <laughs> into myself and understanding <coughs> what's going on. And, and it took me years and years to find out that in reality, um, I, my goal, my purpose was something completely different. Um, and during this experience that I came from suffering in a way, um, came out a beautiful opportunity to be happy and especially consistently and sustainably happy. That, that, that's the trick. I mean, to me, it's so important to understand um, that we are aligning to our values when we live our life. So, you know, just to give you an idea, I, I asked myself, first of all, I didn't know what my values were in the first place. And nobody asked me, and I didn't ask myself. So once I found out my values, then I said, can I... Am I aligned to those values in terms of my daily behaviors? How much time am I aligned to my values? And I realized that I was aligned at 10%. I said, okay, this is no good. And I could hear myself saying, I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to do this. And I said, can I switch from I have to to I want to? Mm -hmm. and, and now I'd say that I am 
100% aligned to my values. So I don't do anything I don't want to do. And yet, I feel I'm giving so much more to others. And so this is just one example. But I went on and on and on. It took me 20 years to, to really fully understand what it takes to live in alignment with yourself. And, and, and so I used this approach called self-science, which, which is the science of you, which really leads to a sustainable happiness. Thank you very much. So don't worry, it doesn't take necessarily 20 years. And uh, we got two important <clears throat> cues. Measure how much your values are aligned with what you're doing and replace I have to with I want to. Now, Mr. Alvira, humans have an innate sense of fairness, as you very eloquently said in your TED, and if you haven't all watched it, you should. It's very, very inspiring. On the other hand, unfairness can deeply contaminate uh, an environment. So how have you created an ecosystem of fairness in ZNAM? Thank, thank you, Christina, and sorry I have a, a very low voice. Uh, I've been presenting a children's book at too many schools and I've lost my voice, so I will do my best. What, um, when I discovered talking to a friend who's a neuroscientist that all humans are born with a very strong sense of fairness. And, and as you said, when, when we perceive unfairness, we go on the defensive, we stop being creative we stop working well in teams. That's when I realized I had to transfer this into the, the business community, which uh, doesn't really think in terms of, 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 of working with the heart. And, and so I kind of worked on the theory for 10 years, talking to headhunters, uh, psychologists, HR directors, and, and several neuroscientists, and came up with a framework where I'm, I'm trying to pursue uh, an effort to move beyond IQ, and I would say also move beyond EQ, and moved into a world of HQ, which I call the heart quotient. And, and, and this is for very um, effective business reasons. Now with the ESG movement, uh, it will also help a lot to achieve greater ESG scores, but, but let's put ESG to the side. If a team is working in a sense of fairness, it can really perform way and above better than a team that is working to chase a bonus or an economic incentive. And, and so what we did in SNAM and what I'm doing every day in my job is to, to work in three dimensions one is really the people, put the people at the center of the organization, put the heart quotient in every uh, people decision, whether it's recruitment, whether it's promotion, whether it's leadership in a project. The second area is to work around processes. We need the processes to be radically transparent. Unfairness hides itself wherever there's a lack of <clears throat> transparency in the allocation of resources. And then, as Professor Formica was saying, uh, we, we work on values and on purpose. We kind of did what, what he did over a 20-year period and a four-year period. We did our own corporate self-science, and we used the model of Aristotle, which I find very effective. Aristotle used to say that for an individual, where his unique strengths overlap with the needs of the world, in that intersection lies his sense of purpose. And when an individual finds his purpose, as we just heard so eloquently, we are much happier and we achieve a sustainable happiness. So what we did with SNAM, we said, what are we good at? We're good at doing several things of building infrastructure, working on big projects, working on international global projects. What does the world need? The world needs cleaner energy. The world needs uh, companies with empathy, companies who give back. We need, uh, the world needs uh, discovery of new types of energies to uh, make sure we can provide energy to those who don't have it and we can do so 
in a totally renewable way. And so we, we drew an intersection point and we defined our purpose as energy to inspire the world, which means, of course, physical energy, but also means emotional energy. And I must say that as we've done so, um, we, we went from being kind of an engineering-based infrastructure company uh, to, to being a, a sought-after place to work. And, and the happiest moment in my professional career is when Forbes nominated us in the top 150 best companies to work at globally and the second best company to work at in Italy. Sorry for my voice. I'll stop here. That is very. Yeah, I hope I've, you can hear me. <laughs> Thank you for making such an effort, and again, proof of working from deep within outwards. Impressive that this happens in a company like yours. And thank you very much. Now, Mr. Karmaura, according to your surveys in Bhutan, material wealth does not often rhyme with happiness. And uh, could you give us insight on this and also uh, share with us, unfortunately briefly, but um, I'm sure it'll be very meaningful, how you think that GNH could possibly be introduced in larger, more industrialized countries? <clears throat> Thank you very much. I, can you hear me? Yes. Can we you can. hear me? Yes, yes, uh, we can. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying that uh, materialism or belief in material wealth has two criteria. One is that uh, success is judged uh, in terms of uh, how much you possess materially or money-wise, uh, whether you are organization, individuals, or companies. And the second part is that uh, the, uh, uh, the happiness is uh, believed to be a uh, sort of increasing function also of material wealth. So these two are important definitional criteria. Now the main problem, uh, uh, why this belief and value in material wealth conflicts with happiness at a societal level is that firstly, it, as you all know, it spurs uh, destructive social competition. And secondly, it also encourages some sort of social sadism, you know, uh, the greater heap of misery uh, people suffer under you, you feel indirectly well. Uh, so sort of negative comparison. And uh, lastly, I think uh, it is based on some notion of social inequality. Uh, what is the evidence from Bhutanese uh, GNH survey uh, about this ambivalent relationship? Uh, if you believe that happiness it can be summed up or measured by subjective well-being, scores, uh, there is some doubt whether we can really measure happiness through this construct. But if you uh, temporarily believe about that, uh, uh, Bhutanese data show that income and assets do not determine happiness in an overwhelming way. Uh, 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 they are not the most significant explanatory factors. Uh, correlation between income and uh, happiness is only 50%, 15%. And in an e overall equation, that's a regression, uh, income can only explain about 3% of variability in happiness scores. So that is very weak, actually. Uh, so there is no overwhelming uh, power uh, of income and asset to explain happiness in Bhutan. Uh, what are the other important, uh, very important factors in the Bhutanese case is a, a prevalence and practice of positive emotions like generosity, compassion, uh, calmness, uh, uh, being endowed with good health and education as you would expect, and of course being always young in mind and body. Uh, but also very important factors in ex uh, explaining happiness is not being widowed or separated. Uh, these have very big influence on individual happiness in this country. What we also know from the happiness scores or subject to well-being scores in Bhutan, uh, a distribution of that is that amongst monks and uh, nuns who do not have um, a very high income at all, um, their happiness score is very high. 
so that is my um, uh, uh, first part of answer on the relationship between happiness and income. Uh, let me move on to ask, uh, answer your question about the desirability of surveys, a GNH type survey in industrial countries in the West. I should say that the uh, main difference uh, between uh, industrial West or industrial East, wherever industrialization is dominant, uh, the main features are the increasing role of machines and technology in the lives of workers. In fact, the distinction is getting uh, more and more blurred. Increasing pressure on individuals' time uh, that compromises their social relationship. Increasing distance from nature and organic systems, uh, synthetics, um, inorganic things are uh, increasingly inter entering commodity system. Increasing threat to mental life because of so many factors. And lastly, increasing disruption uh, to cohesive social networks in industrial societies. Now, there has been, uh, because of this, in parallel uh, concerns and interest in promoting holistic measures uh, on quality of uh, life and well-being. And there are better designed uh, surveys being initiated in uh, most industrialized societies. Uh, my main point is that if a comparatively poor, income poor country like Bhutan uh, can carry out comprehensive uh, surveys that inquires into all aspects and all dimensions of human life, uh, centered on happiness and well-being, uh, much larger industrialized wealthy countries certainly can and should do. I'd like to end uh, by my last words that uh, uh, we can and we should uh, gradually overcome the, what should I say, uh, colonialism and imperialism of GDP accounts, uh, which is purported to be mirror of our happiness. Um, uh, we have to overcome that. Uh, the GDP account, however, is supported by a huge and powerful community of organizations, economy economists, governments, etc. Uh, I'm very happy uh, that this discussion, Regeneration uh, 2030, uh, is taking place in the context of um, our march towards better framework for well-being and sustainability. Thank you. Thank very you very much. <laughs> Thank you. So, yes, we can, right? That, that is our call word. It, if it yes. can happen in your country, it can happen everywhere. Now, Mr. Bolat, you have hands-on experience uh, in all areas of your company, and you were educated both in Europe and in the United States. So you, you really do have a, a large global perspective. What are the biggest opportunities and challenges that you find in integrating sustainable practices in your company, and in particular, the GNH tools that are also developed for business? <coughs> Sustainability is a, is a big word. Now is very much in fashion. Uh, what we have learned as a B Corp is that uh, everything uh, has to be measured. We, uh, we already saw the, this morning, we already heard uh, so many uh, speakers talking about uh, um, indicators. And uh, in a company, it's important to measure um, all, all the efforts that, um, that you make. Um, being, a, being a big corp since 2016 gave us that, uh, that culture of measuring sustainability. And now we are able uh, to, thanks to this culture, we are able to, to put together our own uh, bespoke uh, sustainability strategy uh, and do it in a, in a honest way, not, not on a a la carte way, but approaching the real uh, um, issues uh, on, of our uh, impact uh, in, our, in our company. And, um, 
and um, going towards a positive impact of our organization, uh, inspired more and more by regeneration. Regeneration is a mean to get to sustainability. How, how you, are, you become sustainable? Well, through regenerating practices, through um, a revision of all the, the life cycle of your products. Um, so that is a, the, uh, the opportunity is really to, to change what, uh, the measurements uh, to, to what really matters and, uh, and working towards uh, that journey. It's, the journey is a never-ending journey. And uh, that is, uh, I think that, that's a great opportunity. When it comes to challenges, um, uh, we, we already heard today that it's about systemic change. So challenges are how you are still performing in the market, how you are still pleasing consumers. It's a big effort in educating consumers. Uh, consumers now are changing uh, the way of thinking. They are changing the way they uh, make their choices. So that, uh, the, um, the struggle sometimes is really to be able to find that uh, um, harmony, that balancing act of uh, sustainability and performance and pleasing the consumer that is changing on a daily basis that um, thinking um, uh, process. When it comes to g and uh, I'm uh, very pleased that uh, uh, we're discussing g and uh, these uh, days because uh, uh, I went to Bhutan a few times and I was really impressed and really admired by this small country that is uh, between India and China, so <laughs> very influential, that uh, has done um, so much uh, when it comes to politics on uh, environment, on uh, um, social, social politics, and, uh, and uh, uh, also econo an economical one. Uh, I think the important uh, lesson from um, the Bhutanese experience is that uh, we, we have to look at things in a multidisciplinary way, in a multidimensional way, and happiness is a multidimensional uh, uh, well. um, fact. <laughs> so uh, that, that is, uh, um, it's, um, when it comes to companies, and, and talking about uh, happiness in companies, you need, we, we have to look at uh, the longevity, uh, at the long term of uh, uh, our initiative. I think we, have, uh, uh, we are a finite, uh, uh, as a human race, we are finite, but we bring uh, something infinite with us, maybe through our genetic uh, code. And so uh, we, we have that perspective that uh, is uh, value-driven, purpose-driven. Um, since 15 years, uh, we have um, done our work on our values and our ethics, and so we have uh, the higher purpose of being not the best company in the world, but uh, to be maybe the best company for the world. <laughs> and that is, uh, um, uh, I think, gi is giving a lot of uh, happiness uh, uh, to um, our intentions. So. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, there will be a lot of discussion conversations about metrics, and uh, I think just choosing how to uh, measure and what to measure is a challenge, but I think motivation is, is a big, big factor, and seems like that is abundant in your experience. Oscar, you have created a network of values around Banca Mediolanum, starting from the university through different projects all the way into Flow. How, do, how does this network actually feed the core business? And please tell us also a few words about your new project, Flow. Thanks a lot, <coughs> and good morning to everyone. Yeah, actually, okay, my, my background, um, I just started as a chief training officer in the bank, and then I moved to be the chief marketing officer for almost 10 years, and then now I'm in charge for the innovability. Which, which is a new discipline, something between innovation and sustainability together, and uh, all the value strategy. I was sharing th this just because my path started from education and went through marketing that is supposed to be you know, the most challenging action in a company. When you have to decide if you prefer to spread the voice about your products, all the details about your sales department, or if you wanna put your focus on something new, something else. And years ago, I, just, I thought that could 
the time was ready to start talking about values, to start talking about contents, to start talking about people, instead of talking about products and sales. My personal beliefs is, as a, a good student of big scenarios and mega trends, uh, I had the chance in my last 15 years to share points of view with philosophers, artists, scientists, and economists around the planet. My personal belief is that we are really entering a huge change of epoch. This is going to be a totally new epoch. Will be driven by volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. This is the VUCA approach. So we basically need new people, new humans. We often, too often, forget that companies, corporations, organizations are basically made of people. So we always start as managers, as uh, public administrators, to talk about this kind of complexity made of organization, forgetting that organizations are made of humans. So if we do not start from ourselves, from the self itself, it's not going to work. So the time, is for, the time is ready for companies to lead the change, very well connected to public administrators, and the change is to be led by a change of mind, a change of heart, and a change of actions. So it's time for brand activism. The companies has to take the decision to stay on one side or on the other side. There is no time left to stay somewhere in between just to make some money. Uh, we always have been talking a lot about KPIs, metrics to measure happiness, which is fine. I don't know if you will find the solution. I'm sure that we will not find the solution on time. Okay, and then so whoever leads the company has to decide if they want to pursue happiness based on the fact that happiness will bring results. Otherwise, ask yourself how you feel when you are unhappy. Okay, uh, most of the time I've been asked, so how much money will we make if we will go through this path, education, values instead of sales or whatever else? And the answer has always been the same. Try to think how much money you will not make if you, you, if you will not go through that path. So the time is for, I like this, think approach. Whatever we will do, we should think if what we will be doing will be true, T, helpful, H, inspiring, I, necessary, N, but basically kind. So it's time for kindness, you know? And when you approach a market as a company uh, like mine, for example, a bank, a financial company, it's so nice and even cool and funny to see how people is not expecting you to be faced in the field of happiness, gratefulness, kindness. Like if these topics shouldn't be part of the business, you know? And uh, that's not the time anymore. So I'm so excited to enter this new epoch. And to, to finish, as a financial company, we launched this project uh, months ago, uh, after we launched the project of the university itself, uh, which is Flowey, you were asking me about. It's a, new, uh, it's a new bank, I'm the president and the founder of this bank. Uh, it's a totally new approach. Our KPIs are the number of trees that we planted, uh, the quantity of, of uh, oxygen we, we refueled uh, the atmosphere, uh, the number of whales we saved, or, or turtles, or of how many educational processes we offer for free to the next generation in order to be more aware of themselves, more ready for the new jobs, uh, more capable to face the, the failures, uh, how to behave with your way to nourish yourself, to behave in society. So education, again, is going to be one of the next uh, borders to, to cross. And so as a company, it's not anymore a matter of corporate social responsibility. Because as a company, you must be responsible. That's not the topic. It's a new matter of sustainability and probably regeneration, which is, again, something more. And the main thing to regenerate, the main topic is human, you know, ourselves. Absolutely. Thank you. Very inspiring.
Karen, I can't believe I left the only woman on the panel last, but it was, it was kind of last of this round. Hopefully we'll have time for the second. Thank you so much and so sorry you're not here physically. Now, going back to in a circular way, because we like to be circular to what um, Professor Formiga was saying is uh, really the, the pursuit of happiness does often stem from embracing one's vulnerability. And you are uh, so effective at that that I, I watched you speak in many different circumstances and you just really dig deep into that well that we all have. Now, vulnerability is the portal to empathy, which in turn is a portal to collaboration. So please tell us how um, you see this web, because amongst your many projects, uh, it sounds like it's kind of a common thread, is to see this web of happiness after this journey or during this journey grow in the world. Can, do you think we really uh, can have a community, a global community of people who are working at this level and who are connected? Good morning, everyone. And I'm really excited to be part of this new epoch that, uh, that Oscar was just talking about. Um, yes, for me, uh, my, my catalyst to, uh, to happiness was uh, vulnerability. So through, through pain and suffering, um, I was able to, uh, to, to kind of wake up and grow through tra post-traumatic growth and, and really tap in to this amazing uh, superpower, which, I, which is vulnerability, right? Um, and I believe that when we are able to really be truly human and fully ourselves, as Sandra was, was uh, sharing in the beginning, it's really when we can optimize all our strength and even be aware of the strengths that we have, right? And uh, through the work that we do at the World Happiness Summit, we, we want to bring the science alive, so to feel the science. So why, why do you want to be happy, right? It, has to, it feels good, it feels good to be happy, but there's also uh, scientific evidence why it's a good, it's a, it's a, per, a, a pursuit worth following. It's a process that we should engage in because it optimizes mental health, emotional health, relationships. It opti as we heard here on the panel, it optimizes results, business results. Um, so really, it's a it's a good thing to do just on principle, and the evidence is is there now. Um, the science shows us the the from economics, uh, positive psychology, um, endless right. And uh, I, I believe that uh, during this time of real disruption, right, we, we went from, from one channel and just immediately had to kind of jump tracks to something completely different. So we have a huge opportunity. People are talking about silver linings, right? Um, and, uh, and it's truly amazing to see what is possible if we um, learn, we talked about uh, the importance of teaching. Uh, we have to teach around happiness. We have to have a language mm -hmm. around happiness and sustainability, right? What, what does it mean? Um, we we definitely have a language around negativity, unhappiness and, um, and illness. It's remarkable to me that we don't need to really spend much time explaining around that. And we understand that anxiety and depression are very real concepts, but when we talk about happiness, mm -hmm. It's almost like we are talking about uh, Santa Claus, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's it's uh, it's it's valid. It's uh, it's timely. Um, we need to uh, show the practical tools to people, to children, to individuals. We have to make the the case for happiness and the business case for it. Um, and I believe it's very important that. It has to come, it's a grassroots approach. So you do, you are responsible for your own happiness, absolutely, and it's subjective and so forth. But I love being part of this conversation because we need to have a systemic approach. So we have to go top down as well. So we have to start um, rewarding a different type of, uh, of, of, of behavior, right? So um, we need to reward kindness. We need to reward a vulner vulnerability, create a circumstances where this can, this can be um, something that people can feel safe in engaging in. And I'm, I'm very excited about what the future can bring. In my personal life, just to share very briefly, um, I lost my, my husband 
remarkably to the flu. So he died of a pneumonia, which is uh, this, this current situation is, uh, is remarkable how, how similar uh, that experience was for me. But the amazing thing is that you can make a choice so you can make a decision and you can, um, in my case, it was through purpose and meaning and through uh, engaging in uh, vulnerability and then empathy, just the empathy that under and the understanding and giving space to people and the possibilities of what can be. And it, we, we're primed for it. And if before the world was, was in need of this, we're particularly in need of it now. I'm very excited to be part of, of this. I think this community, this conversation we're having today is incredibly important. And I think that this will be um, just a silver lining and, and we have we have an opportunity, we have a choice and, and we can together collectively decide to do something different and create win-win scenarios for everyone and having the umbrella of happiness as a guiding post and as a, our inner compass and also the compass of our organizations and societies and, and governments is incredibly exciting. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, describing happiness seems so much harder than describing fear and pain. And the word cloud, as Oscar was saying, is, is really important because we have to agree, and this is the same about sustainability. We, we use one word and it's got a million definitions. I could go on forever asking you questions and I thought that it would be nice if you each asked each other a question but I'm getting signs of wrapping it up. So why don't we see if, if any of you have a burning question for one other. I'm afraid we can't do the full round, but I would like to remind us, you, and everyone else who's connected that there is a chat in the app, and it would be wonderful to continue the flow of the conversation. I certainly will do so with you because this is something that I feel deeply, very deeply about, and I think you gave very different and synergic uh, perspectives. But time for maybe one or two burning questions on your behalf. <laughs> Who dare go first? Maybe you should, Karen, being the only woman on the panel. Oh my. <laughs> well, uh, I'd love to know more about the, um, the, the, the corporate manifesto at, uh, at the, uh, the Venus. That would be interesting to see how we can start uh, uh, encouraging companies to, to follow this uh, guide. Fantastic. <clears throat> in in Davines, we, we want to offer a, a better life uh, uh, through beauty, ethics, and uh, sustainability. So these are the our three key words. Beauty, because we are in, in the beauty industry. Ethics, because I think it's the base of uh, uh, what we do. Is, um, and uh, sustainability is the, is, the, is the journey. Fantastic. There you go. We, uh, we do speak more and more in acronyms, but <laughs> it's important to be concise. It's nice to see you back. Um, or you were here with us, but to see you back on the screen uh, to Mr. Alvera. I don't know, maybe I'm, I might be going over time. I should not be doing that, but maybe one last burning question, and then we'll wrap it up if there is one. You're shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> I think the, the topic is so broad that to confine it to one question, I think um, everything I've heard uh, from, from the academic world, from, from Bhutan, where I've been several times, I mean, the, the time is now, it's all converging. Um, I'm also on, on, on the board of SMP, the rating agency. ESG is going to drive such a profound change in the world of finance, in the world of business. And we did some work with Jan. Um, the, the whole S question is, is really unaddressed. And people are trying to work out metrics for the S. People will need to have metrics for the S. And if you just ask a very simple question, how are you? You just get magical responses. And so we're in favor of just keeping it real simple. We want to launch the World Wellbeing Movement, WWM, to do what the WWF does for the environment, for well-being. And you can boil all this down to one question. 
And that question should be asked everywhere, in every country, in every company, in every public office, in every hospital. How are you? So you. over to you, Karen, and sounds like a very interesting dynamic. The sad thing is that's what we often start a conversation with. How are you? And the answer is always fine, because no one's going to say, look, I'm really actually in a very diff difficult spot. But going back to the very inspiring Bhutanese experiences, uh, it, it, good results come when you're happy and not the other way around. So let's all really nourish by embracing our vulnerability and our challenges our journey to happiness. Thank you very, very much to you all. It's been Thank wonderful you. to hear all your perspectives. Yeah.